This is a miniature model of 10 Rillington Place, where a London-based serial killer once lived and murdered his victims. Since these horrific events took place, 10 Rillington Place has since been demolished and the street name has been changed. To recreate this location, I built a miniature using references from various sources to be able to take a look inside and better observe the property. At the time of the murders, during the 1940s and 50s, this area, known as Notting Hill, was considered impoverished and under-resourced. This was also a time when abortion was illegal in England and sex work was providing financial means for countless women, a combination that would allow John Reginald Christie to lure his victims to his place of residency at 10 Rillington Place. How exactly did he do this? Christie had a number of changing careers, including military service, though he claimed to have the medical training needed to provide medical aid and perform procedures. In actuality, he was not qualified to do the things he'd claimed. Being that his crimes took place in an area which lacked financial support, and during a time where abortion was sought after, but illegal, Christie was offering alternatives to people in vulnerable situations that could potentially lead them into his grasp. He often targeted women who came to him seeking medical treatment, often abortions. He also targeted sex workers who were less likely to be reported missing and could be more easily convinced to come to his home under the guise of sex work. Once he had lured the victims there and having them convinced that this was a part of the procedure, he had a makeshift apparatus made out of a glass jar that had two hoses attached to it. One hose was connected to a gas line, which emitted carbon monoxide. The other hose was connected to a jar with perfumed water, meant to disguise the smell of the gas. These hoses all connected to a mask the women were told to wear to inhale the fumes. Christie would sometimes use this homemade device to knock his victims unconscious. From there, he raped some of the women before strangling them all to death. He hid their bodies in various parts of the property such as the backyard, under the floorboards, and in hidden alcoves in the walls. Neighbors had even complained of the strong smell coming from Christie's residence on multiple occasions. To mitigate the odor and to prevent bodily fluids from leaving evidence, he often tied makeshift diapers around the victims and used heavy disinfectants on the bodies in areas where they were hidden to try and cover up the stench of decomposition. Christie's first victim is believed to be 21-year-old Ruth First, who he killed in 1943. Many suspected she was a sex worker, but Christie described her as a lover. After this apparent first murder, which many believed was unplanned, Christie formulated a strategy for carrying out his future crimes. His established alibi was taking sick leave from work and would even visit a doctor to make sure it was on the record that he'd been assessed. This provided the window he needed to commit the murders and cover them up during the time he was supposedly out sick before returning to work. So, what eventually brought John Christie's crimes to light? His spree spanned between 1943 to 1953, and his crimes would not come to surface until his encounters with Timothy, Beryl, and Geraldine Evans, a young couple who took up residency on the third floor of 10 Rillington Place in 1948. Timothy and Beryl Evans had an infant daughter named Geraldine, and the couple was often heard shouting and fighting from their third floor flat by surrounding neighbors. Timothy and Beryl had each individually reported tumultuous times in their marriage, with verbal and filed reports of domestic violence, accusations of infidelity, and unpaid debts. It wouldn't be long before the Evans would learn that they were expecting another child. This news weighed heavily on the hardships they were already experiencing, turning a rough situation into a desperate one. But for Christy, this was an opportunity to exploit their circumstances for his own sadistic pleasure. After learning about the couple's dilemma, witnessing their challenging relationship, and hearing that Beryl was seeking an abortion, Christie allegedly offered his professional advice on how to solve their problem, claiming that he not only had the knowledge, but the skill to perform abortions. As mentioned before, abortion was illegal in England at the time, leading many to believe this was why Beryl Evans may have taken Christie up on his offer. 
Timothy was supposedly out of the house during the procedure, during which Beryl was gassed, raped, and strangled to death by Christy. And this is where things get a little messy. The body of the couple's young daughter, Geraldine, was also discovered when her mother was. Some believe that her father, Timothy, was involved in the murder of both mother and daughter. This theory is primarily based on the history of fighting and possible violence between Beryl and Timothy. And to further complicate the matter, in the time between Beryl's murder and when her body was actually discovered, Timothy had reportedly been lying about his wife's whereabouts when in actuality, she was already dead. On December 2nd, 1949, the bodies of Beryl and Geraldine Evans were discovered. Beryl was found in the property's shared outhouse, and Geraldine, who had been strangled with a tie, which was still around her neck, was found behind the same building. Upon further investigation, it was discovered that Beryl was 16 weeks pregnant upon her death, suggesting that the alleged abortion either failed or had never taken place. Additionally, there were clear signs of struggle. Despite the evidence, the investigation itself was heavily criticized for major oversights. A femur bone from one of Christie's victims was propped up against the wall surrounding his garden, in plain sight. Christie apparently made no attempt to hide the bone after accidentally digging it up, and it was not noted by police. Additionally, the bodies that Christie buried in the backyard prior to this were not discovered when police were searching for Beryl and Geraldine Evans. Despite the serial killer, John Christie, actually being at the center of the crime, Timothy Evans was the one who was heavily suspected. Further complicating things for himself, Evans told people that Beryl and the baby were living away, and he told others that he was caring for his daughter before leaving for work the mornings leading up to the discovery of their bodies. Additionally, Timothy provided confessions where he admitted to killing his daughter, but many believe that the confession may have been coerced without full understanding of the implications, as Timothy was thought to have a very low IQ. It was also reported that Timothy had made verbal threats to kill Beryl, and during his initial confession, which may or may not have been under coercion, he claimed he killed her accidentally by supplying her with abortion pills. Essentially, Evans' confession and reports of prior marital disputes made him a clear suspect. During the trial, both Christie and Evans blamed one another for the murder of Beryl Evans. At this point, Evans had already retracted his confession, claiming that Christie, who was the star witness, had done it. The case was made that Evans and his team believed he may have been coerced into making a false confession by the police, and that John Christie actually murdered Beryl and Geraldine Evans. However, aided majorly by Christie's testimonies, Timothy Evans was ultimately charged and found guilty for the death of his wife, Beryl, and daughter Geraldine, and was executed on March 9, 1950. But the story doesn't end there. After the execution of Timothy Evans, Christie continued killing until 1953. Among his victims was his own wife, Ethel, whose body was also hidden at 10 Rillington Place. In March of 1953, John Christie signed over his remaining lease to a new tenant and moved out of the property. Days after doing so, the building owner discovered a secret nook hidden behind some wallpaper while completing some renovations. Behind the wallpaper were multiple dead bodies. A full police investigation led to the discovery of Christie's other victims on the property, including his wife, Ethel. The bodies were found hidden in the backyard, beneath the floorboard, and behind the kitchen nook. In total, six bodies were discovered on the property during this search that would be linked to Christie. By this point, Christie was on the run, but not for long. With his face plastered on newspapers all over the city, Christie was spotted unkempt and wandering about by a police officer. He recognized and took Christie into custody just 10 days into the police's search for him. Christie admitted to the murders of the victims found on the property, including Beryl Evans, but he firmly denied responsibility for the strangulation and death of her infant daughter, Geraldine. This would be the only murder that he would never admit to. He initially pled guilty by reason of insanity, but the plea was dismissed and he was found competent to stand trial. At this time, Christie was only technically being tried for the murder of his wife, Ethel Christie. For this crime, he was found guilty and sentenced to death. And despite maintaining his innocence in regards to Geraldine Evans' death, the court determined Christie was guilty of both her 
and her mother's murders. Christie was executed by hanging on July 15, 1953. In the end, despite Christie admitting to all but one murder, therefore making him a serial killer, the debate continued about whether or not Timothy Evans had anything to do with the murder of his wife and child, mostly due to the fact that Christie admitted to all but Geraldine's murder. Christie's refusal to claim responsibility for Geraldine's death and the possibility of Evans having had a cognitive disability were both factors in this debate. Despite the disagreement, the courts determined that Evans was innocent and Christie was fully responsible for the crimes in question. Unfortunately, it was too late for Evans, who had already been put to death in 1950. In 1966, Timothy Evans was granted a posthumous pardon for his charges, and his murder conviction was later considered a crime of John Christie's. This, along with the apparent mishandling of the case surrounding Geraldine's death, proved powerful in the movement to abolish the death penalty in the UK. The initial bill was passed in 1965, and the law was made permanent in 1969. As a byproduct of Christie's crimes and Evans' execution, the death penalty was outlawed in the UK. 